Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture, and today we are finally going to be talking about the newest album from Saba, Care For Me. Well, this has been very, very long in coming. And indeed, Saba's a name that's been on my radar for some time, even despite the fact it has taken months for his album to ascend up my schedule. He's loosely affiliated with many of the indie acts in the Chicago scene that I have covered on this show. He's shown up on Chance the Rapper's Acid Rap and Coloring Book, Donnie Trump and the Social Experiments album Surf from 2015, and he and No Name have traded guest appearances on each other's respective projects. Hell, he was on Room 25 earlier this year. And while he built a fair amount of buzz coming off of a couple mixes, tapes, he first came to my attention proper with his 2016 debut album Bucket List Project. And for the most part, I did like it, but I wouldn't really say it was something that really resonated with me as much as I was hoping. Because for as versatile as Saba was as an MC, he definitely wore some of his influences on his sleeve. I mean, sure, detailed flair to a lot of his writing, and he had really good taste in some jazzy instrumentals, and he pulled out some good guest performances too, but I struggle to say that I was in a huge hurry to come back to it, and it was kind of tricky for me to pinpoint why. Maybe the songs just weren't quite there yet, or he hadn't quite refined his own unique voice, but I did figure that would likely come in the follow-up, and given the whole critical reception that Care For Me has received and the number of year-end lists it's landed on, I had every reason to believe that this would be a great listen, so what do we get with this? So here's the thing. This is one of those rare projects for which I can see why it's received so much critical acclaim from certain quarters, and also why some critics who aren't so high on it carry those opinions. And the weird thing is that I think I might agree with all of them. What this might mean for me is that while I do like Care For Me by Saba as he doubles down on the detail-rich and nuanced storytelling that's always been his biggest selling point for me, at the same time I don't quite love this project as it wears its influences all the more starkly on its sleeve and as an uneven package that rarely brings together the focus to truly connect for me on a deeper level. A cohesive listen, but a scattered one. A really good album, but not quite great at least for me. And since this is bound to drive the most controversy right from the jump, let's start off with Saba himself as an MC and some of those influences. And what's important to stress here is that I don't have a problem with that said influences are evident in his style. That's true about nearly every single artist that I've ever covered. And the pedigree of Isaiah Rashad, Earl Sweatshirt, maybe a splash of Mick Jenkins, and especially Chance the Rapper, it shows that Saba at the very least has good taste in influences. And if he would just sound like a little bit like those artists while still doing his own thing, that'd be one thing. But where I and some critics take notice is that Saba will intentionally bend and shift the timbre of his delivery to more closely imitate some of those styles and cadences to fit specific songs. And what's exasperating is that he doesn't really need to do it. I've called Logic out when he's done it, I'll call Saba out too. When the album's at its best, when it's telling a story and embracing increasingly aggressive flows like on Fighter or Prom King, Saba truly comes into his own and showcases the most distinctive personality. The issue is that he's not consistently in that lane, and thus going on delivery alone, it's hard not to hear him as a softer Earl on songs like Broken Girls, a more coherent Isaiah Rashad on Grey, or a darker, less earnest chance on Smile, Log Out, and Life. Even if he wants to avoid the comparisons to other rappers on the latter song, he tried to lampshade it, but he's not getting away with it. And you know what? that'll still be enough of a differentiation for a lot of people, especially when you factor in some of the more distinct production, which is where if I'm gonna nitpick, I tend to find my toughest hangups with this album. And again, I get why it's eased back on some of the jazzier live elements that characterize Bucket List Project. This is aiming for a much more grim, fragmented, downbeat atmosphere, while still maintaining a Chicago sound with a firmer live bass lines and the touches of horns that creep in, all the while letting the program percussion sound rougher and grimier, and the mixes sinking into a lot murkier tones. And as you would expect, this album can feel a little bit slower and longer, although Saba's faster flows do a solid enough job keeping the pace, and when this album can switch into some more live drums and more aggressive jazzy elements of the horns, the second halves of Grey and Prom King are great examples of this, it can hit a vibe I really like, and it never feels too long. But this is also where we have to talk about some of the tonal choices, specifically in the pianos and guitars that almost intentionally sound askew or off-key. 
which can work, don't get me wrong, but it can become increasingly hit and miss if they connect for me, especially if the production just further submerges them, and especially when they tack on this auto-tune passages that pick up an odd graininess that I'm not sure is the best fit with the rest of the mix. Then you have the wonky bass on life, the out-of-tune pianos on calligraphy and prom king, and especially the bad guitar tuning on fighter and broken girls. If you just can't vibe with the tuning or the melody very quickly, or once Saba chops it up to ride it, it can be kind of hit and miss. And while I'm on that subject, for as many of these songs feel like two parts, the switch-ups can be pretty hit and miss too. From the drippier outro to Broken Girls to the pitch-shifted trap segment at the end of Fighter that feels really tacked on to a much better song and it doesn't even really fit thematically. But you know what? I'm not going to deny that some of these elements don't fit the overall atmosphere. As I said before, it is cohesive. And this takes us to the hardest conversation about the album, the content. Now to put it bluntly, if there's a move for this album, it's analogous to kind of what Earl Sweatshirt was exploring throughout some rap songs. Depression, projections of strength amidst piecemeal success, and dealing with grief in the face of real losses within the family, which for Saba comes with his cousin and fellow member of Pivot Gang, John Walt, passing away or getting killed. And when this album sticks to those stories and that arc, I would argue it easily hits the most success. From the misconnections and guilt that racked the in medias res opening of Busy Sirens, to the sunken depression of calligraphy, to the truly excellent storytelling that infuses Fighter in the final two songs of this album. Fighter in particular stands out very vividly for me, as Saba shows in sharp relief the fair fist fights that might become unfair with his girl when she refused to really engage in this argument, we'll come back to that, all the way perhaps the least fair fight of all against himself. And while I usually have issues with songs like Grave that rant against the exploitative music industry, I at least have to give Saba some credit for acknowledging that same twisted hustle anyway that they have that would profit off of his pain, especially given that calligraphy shows just how much of his bars serve as a coping mechanism for him, and if the industry is extrapolating it to an omnipresent feeling of melancholic gray, well, that happens, and he's not really happy about it, but he's not sure what he can do. And while it is good to acknowledge that Saba has also turned on the radio in 2018, I also want to highlight a persistent issue I have with the writing. A weird defensiveness surrounding some of his insecurities, especially with women. Broken Girls is the most immediate example and probably the weakest song on the album because of it. Yes, I actually appreciate the balanced framing and the trauma that Saba has suffered does make his actions explainable in this toxic relationship, but then by tacking on that outro to that song, it's clear that he's trying to give himself a way out, and while well, Calligraphy is saying that he doesn't want any Anybody to feel sorry for him going what he's going through. Broken Girls kind of feels like a betrayal of that, otherwise why would it have that outro? And then there's Log Out, another anti-social media song which brings up chance for a really underwhelming verse. It doesn't quite seem to mesh with the album's themes and atmosphere as much as I'd overall like. But you know what? I'll give Saba this. The album ends incredibly well. First with the extended storytelling describing the complexities of his relationship with Walt, the detailing that cousin that his parents separated Saba from very young given his poor background, the rougher crowd that Walt hung around with, and yet Saba's desire to fit in amongst them, riding just on sheer exhaustion when he's threatened, and that requirement that Walt had to take public transit where he was ultimately killed. And then ultimately, the album ends on a brighter note with heaven all around me, offering a moment of respite speaking from Walt's perspective as he might now just be in a better place. And by writing all this down, by trying to get it out, by extension, maybe so is Saba. So at the end of the day, Man, this is the sort of project that I'll admit it grew on me with every single listen, but it also kind of hit a peak with how much I could truly love it. The writing for the most part is really strong, the flows, they're great, and Sama still shows a knack for thematic resonance and cohesion and honesty that I think will be great for him going forward. But stylistically, I think the next big step is to find more of a lane that is his alone, and while I'm absolutely confident he will get there, this is a project that he kind of had to make for his own reasons, I hope he can find the confidence to get there as well. He's on the right path, I just not quite there yet. As such, I'm giving this a very strong 7 out of 10, absolutely a recommendation, even though I would argue that all the fans and all the critical acclaim will do far more than my criminally late comments and review ever will. Definitely worth you keeping an eye on this going forward though, so yeah, make some time, check this out. It's worth it. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Yeah, I know, I'm very, very late to the party, but it's a really good album. Definitely, if you guys want to buy or stream it, link's down there below. And the poll's up there for all you telling me that this is album of the year, or how wrong I am, go ahead, have fun. 
Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. If you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process so I could have covered this six months ago, link to my Patreon right over there. We're three times a week, you guys get to vote on my schedule, and once a week for the higher tier contributors, you guys get to add albums, movies, or even a top 10 list to that schedule. More details right over there. You want to see my schedule? Link down there below. But till then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time. Check, I get a call and get a fishy feeling. Normally, while joke on the